Welcome back. So, um, I realized that in some of my previous recordings, some of the titles might have been cut off because of the webcam being there. Rest assured that you're not going to be missing too much important stuff from that, and there's a chance my lecture slides will be uploaded this time anyway. So, at the end of the day, there's nothing much to worry about. Alright, so for the content, I am not going to use my slides, actually. Instead, I'll now temporarily get rid of my webcam and I'm going to look at what basically would have been your handout this time round if we had done a proper lecture. This time round, what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to fill out some of my gaps that I left during my hardest three unit talk during the trial survival and basically look for questions that will probably get you a high band E4 and are, let's just say, not that hard to discuss. So the first question is from 2003 is question AB, the very, very last question. It is bloody long. Some of you might want to just pause the video and digest it all. Or maybe even after the paper itself, but I'm just going to jump straight into it, yeah? So what they'll do is, so in this question, I'll give you basically what's important and then also give you the question that they ask during that part. <laughs> so for this question, they give you a family of integrals, as they call a family for some reason in this really, really weird form. I don't know why it's given like that. And they'll say to use integration by parts to deduce something really, really bizarre. Okay, intimidating, but it's just by parts, so we can just step back, breathe, and do the computation. So, <clears throat> I'm looking at what I'm aiming for, and I realise my powers want to go down, and that's when my intuition is now kicking in, saying that, oh, okay, this is probably what I want to differentiate in my biparts, so I'll probably integrate the cos instead. I've color-coded it for your easiness to read. And I'll do my biparts operation, I'll use the chain rule to differentiate where I need to. And that's my first integration by parts done after this point. And that'll evaluate to zero because pi squared on 4 minus pi squared on 4 is equal to zero, and you're subbing pi on 2 in to get pi squared on 4 be rushed, but you should be able to see how that works eventually. And what I'll do is I have to now integrate by parts again, and this is probably going to get really bizarre now because I'll have to use the product rule to differentiate it in my by parts. But no worries, I'm just going to persist through it and see how things go. I'm missing an x here, but don't worry, it won't matter too much. I apologize for the mistake. I'll just see what goes on. And as so Stan, if I just use some factorial tricks, like this one you've seen here. After a lot of tidying things up, eventually I'll get to what I want to get to. And you might want to just pause the video, literally just step back and actually digest all of the working out really slowly rather than my rushed explanation. But I'm just going to go on. So part two, I want to remind you that in the question that they said, suppose that pi could be written in the form p and q with p and q with positive integers. So we're assuming pi is some kind of rational number here. And then they, I define the integrals again. And they say, by writing x squared as this, where appropriate, deduce my reduction formula, given in the line below. <laughs> so, okay, so I'm going to look at these two integrals separately. For the first integral, I realize, oh, all I need to do is basically just spit out a q squared. And then pretty much there is an i n minus 1 right there in front of me straight away. That is fucking brilliant. The other one, okay, yeah, probably going to do a lot more work here. And again, my intuition is kicking in. I see, well, okay, my original reduction formula already had pi squared on 4 minus x squared to some power. So I probably don't want to replace this x squared with all of that mess. On the other hand, something like this x squared, I probably do. And I will. And the idea is that once I do this, what I can do is that then I can extend expand it, and that might be something that's really, really hard to see. All I am doing here is expanding the brackets and then splitting up the integral right after. And you might want to pause the video here and think about that as well. And the idea is that after I do all of that, then I can basically combine, well, that just gets combined into here. Pi squared on 4 will get poured out into the front of the other side, and I'm left with something that's much more nicer in that I actually have i n minus 2 and i n minus 1 appearing out when they should be. And last thing I want to mention, pi squared q to the 4 became p squared q squared because of our earlier assumption that pi is equal to p over q. And then if I combine everything together, happy days. Somehow, I ended up with a not too bad reduction formula. 
Not too bad, yeah. I know it's shit, but it could be worth Alright. <coughs> so for part three, given I know it's equal to two and I want to equal to four q squared and the reduction formula we had in the previous part, explain briefly why I is an integer. You can get away with just writing one or two sentences here, but I'll expand on the idea first because this is technically number theory. It's a bit hard. <coughs> it's kind of obvious straight away that when I when n equal to zero or n equal to one, you have integers because they literally give it to you what they're actually equal to. Whereas for something like I two, you can just do the reduction formula, and you'll see that you get an integer times an integer times an integer minus another integer, so that's still going to be an integer, right? And the idea is that in a similar way, i n will always be an integer no matter what, because if you just keep using your reduction formula, you will eventually get all the way down to i naught and i1, and at the end of the day, you are just going to have your coefficients being a sum of integers, or a difference of integers like here with the minus signs, or a product of integers with the multiplication going on, and that is still going to be an integer, so if all the ingredients are an integer and you haven't done any division, your final result will also be an integer as well. Alright? <coughs> so in part 4, we suppose that pi can be written in this p on q form and p and q are, again, integers. And here is a bunch of integrals for you to deal with. Now prove an interesting inequality, and the reason why I picked this question to come first is because this covers one of the things I didn't cover at my lectures, and it's how to do integral inequalities in Carter 3 units. So for integrals, usually what you do, and you'll see this in my notes as well, the idea is that you will be given some kind of graph, or you draw your own graph, and you just compare the areas. <coughs> this whole area comparison can be compacted in a way into words by just saying, well, okay, if you have a function that is always below another function, and you smack a definite integral ar around it, then the integral stays the same. This will apply for integrals that are not strict, so less than or equal to, and integrals that are strict, so ones that are only strictly less than. In our scenario, <coughs> so this question was really, really hard, it was in 20 2003, so it meant you had to use a lot of intuition here. The idea was that <coughs> over your domain, x is between plus or minus pi on 2, you could deduce the first inequality, and be careful that it's only because of this interval we're allowed to do that. On the other hand, cos x less than 1 is always true because that's just the range of the cos. <coughs> and if you recall the whole multiplying inequality thing here, I end up getting with this fancy result here. And what I can do now is say, well, okay, <coughs> I knew i n was equal to this random thing going on here. That was by definition. And well, all I can do is basically here I can slap an integral from minus pi on 2 to pi on 2 on both sides and my inequality will be preserved. So what's going to happen is I can therefore deduce that I'm going to have a less than sign here. Q the 2 and factorial, blah blah blah. And ultimately, after some rearranging, it gets me to exactly what I need. Let's move on. <coughs> and for part 5, okay, so suppose blah blah blah. Deduce that pi is irrational, and this is a very rare appearance of proof by contradiction. So let's look at what's going on. <coughs> we know that pi is, can be written as the form p on q, or rather we assumed it. Therefore we've assumed pi is a rational number. That is actually the definition of a rational number, in case you've forgotten. And we've proven in part 3 that i n is an integer, and what's going on in part 4, sorry about that, is that we're saying that if we make n sufficiently large, i n is ultimately going to become less than 1 as well, because this is less than 1. That's like the squeeze theorem in my notes in a way. <coughs> so what I've really done is basically proven that i n is an integer, and i n is between 0 and 1, and boom! I basically just contradicted myself, because I'm saying i n is a whole number, and a decimal at the same time. Therefore, my assumption was wrong to begin with, so pi is irrational, and basically that's how proof of contradiction works. You assume something, and then you get to something else that is just sheer nonsense. Okay, let's move on. So for this block, the next thing I want to talk about, and pretty much the last thing, is basically the combinatorial question that I didn't get to talk about during my trial survival, 
and that was the nasty derangement question that somehow made its way into the 2016 exam. No idea how it got there, but I'm going to talk about it now so that we cover basically every possibility. So this question works like this. They'll give you n people, and every person has a hat. No worries, and therefore we're going to have n different hats. Still fair enough. And then what's going to happen is that they're going to ha put the hats on a table, and then later everyone will just pick up any random hat. And a derangement is just a situation where we ensure that none of the people have picked up their own hat. <laughs> and then we'll say Tom's one of the n people. And we're going to first consider a special case where Tom finds that he picks up somebody's hat and they pick up their hat as well. And we want to count the number of ways this can happen. So the idea is that what we've really done is that we've imposed a restriction. In any of the derangements we're given, Tom must pick a hat that is not his and therefore we have n minus 1 different choices of this happening. So we first suppose, okay, Tom picks up person B's hat. <coughs> well, there's n minus 1 choices, nice and easy. Person B must pick up Tom's hat, and there's only one way that can be done, so we multiply by 1 here. And everyone else, we just have n minus 2 people, they are basically going to just be in their own derangement, so that's going to happen in D n minus 2 ways, and that is basically going to give you the exact result that they were looking for here. Okay, moving on. And now they want you to consider all of the remaining possible derangements. So this is now an exhaustion process. We've got to consider the other possibility. And therefore, they want you to basically realise that this is going to be a recursion formula for the number of derangements given n people. Okay, that came out really terribly, but don't worry about that. So we'll just go to the other case. Here we assume that person B picks up Tom's hat as well. Now we're going to start the same way, n minus 1 cases, but then person B will not pick up Tom's hat anymore, and that's going to change things a little. <coughs> because person B is now not picking up Tom's hat, he is really just, or she is, just another person in all of the remaining n minus 1 people altogether. He is no longer separate with Tom in that they pick up each other's hat, but rather he or she is now just another person in the lot. So, we're going to have n-1 people, and among them, there are going to be d n-1 possible derangements instead. And that's going to give us this formula. <laughs> and lastly, if you remember how exhaustion works, once we've figured out all the cases, we add them back together, and there is our answer, which is exactly what we wanted to, because all we have to do here is just factorise, yeah? <laughs> nice and easy. Ugh, I'm not sure what happened with the formatting here, but it's okay. This part is really, really easy. I'll just discuss it very briefly. <coughs> this is why I like to call the no-brainer type question, because if you stare hard enough, you realise all you have to do is just expand it out, and then move something to the other side, and then you're done. Easiest one mark ever I've seen in a four-unit question 16. Easiest. And then you move on. <coughs> so you have your formula here. And what might not be so obvious is that what you've really done is basically generated a recursion formula. What you can do here is now basically apply this formula over and over again. So firstly with n, then with n minus 1, then with n minus 2, and then with n minus 3, n minus 4, and so on. And eventually you will get all the way down to d2 minus d1. Just be careful with the whole minus 1 thing, but the idea is that you're just using the formula over and over again. And once you do all of that, you're going to get 1 minus 0, which is equal to 1, and you arrive at minus 1 to the n minus 2. But of course, when it comes to minus 1, you have this fudgy thing of minus 1 squared is equal to 1, and you're ultimately going to get where you need to be. Everyone hates fudging, but sometimes you just need it. And lastly, 2 mark induction, we'll just roll straight into it. Remember, you don't have to be asked on the three common ones in three unit anymore. You can be asked on anything. Here, we just chuck n equals one straight away, and we get all of that. We get sum up to one. We evaluate the sum. Blah, 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 blah. Nobody cares. Nice and easy. And then we suppose the statement is true for some integer k, so we assume that we have k's here now. And we want to prove it's true when n equals k plus one, as usual. And we're going to start by just using what we had at the beginning. We can always assume that this is true. I'm just going to use that now with n equals k plus 1 instead to get that. And then dk, well, okay, I'm just going to use now my uh, assumption, and I'll get back to here. Still no worries. 
And then after I use my assumption, I'm going to use my factorial trick on this one to get the k plus 1 factorial out in front. It might help to write out what you're trying to prove. Here I didn't. I'm just going to assume that you know what we're trying to prove. And the idea is that that gets the k, factor, k plus 1 factorial that we need. And then, well, okay, I'm just going to cheat here. I'm just going to fudge this factor in. And the last bit might not be so obvious anymore. You might want to pause the video. The idea is that this is an E4 question because the last step actually required you to put this term back into the sum as well. You'll notice how I went from k up to k plus 1 here. But then once you're there, you're basically done and your induction is complete. So basically, moral of the story, do induction the same old way, nothing different, just more variety. And that's it for this content block, so I'll see you again in the next one.